Good afternoon and welcome this afternoon to our uh, Fiber Pre-Deployment Collaborative Framework. This is the third episode in a series that we've been running that really looks at a collaboration between the private and public sector around the pre-deployment or provision for the pre-deployment of fiber in all new builds. Um, today is the last uh, um, episode of this current series, and we're very, very excited to have a panel of, of experts with us today. And we're going to be discussing what we have, what we've achieved over the last few months, uh, what our goals are looking into the future. And we've also got some incredible examples of very successful developments that have embraced the concept of fiber, of pre-deployment, of sustainability, and uh, we look forward to presenting them to you today. So just before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping. I, I know most of you um, are well, very much aware of this. Um, we are recording this session and we will be sharing this content with um, a number of individuals over the coming weeks. So um, just be aware that the, the, the webinar is recorded. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a chat box. Within that chat box, please feel free to send any questions that you might have to our panel. Um, that we are on call, we're right here, we're happy to respond. And um, that anything that you might um, want to ask, this is a golden opportunity to, to do that. During the course of the webinar, we will also be running some polls. They will pop up onto your screen. Um, you can answer them with please, it'd be fantastic. This data is so valuable. Answer the questions and then we, and you can click the little red button to get the poll off your screen and continue listening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel um, coming to us uh, from Huawei, who have spearheaded a lot of the campaigning that we've done is Marius Enelbrecht. He's a senior strategy consultant. Um, Olaf Eriksson, who is a, the property developer of a, basically a, a new smart city development for Glencullen Private Estate out in Middleburg, which has done some groundbreaking things, and we'll hear about that. Brett Petzer, who will be joining us at half past three, um, and he's going to talk about what he's achieved in his uh, Green Hills Estate, which is um, a completely AI-driven development, um, and he's really, he's gone uh, completely and totally off the grid, um, and I, it's actually so interesting, and I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing about that. And then to round off today's afternoon is Janita Clark. She's from the CEO of the Digital Council Africa, and the Digital Council Africa are going to be spearheading this campaign into 2021 with us, and we're just going to break down on what that way forward looks like. So before we um, introduce Marius, I would just want to give you a little summary of what we have achieved to date. Um, Julie, if you don't mind going to the next frame, the next slide. So in our first webinar, we introduced the concept of a pre-deployment or rapid deployment strategy. We introduced the concept of the framework. So we brought in Arthur from Huawei. Um, he came in and he presented to us the current um, installation models that are available and the efficiency around each one of those models. We then looked at the landscape of South African for South African operators and some of the challenges. We then looked at what the developers challenges were. And at the time, the communication policy was um, the talk of the town. And uh, so we broke down what that policy would mean for individual homeowners and residents living within communities or outside of communities, um, should there be any need for infrastructure to be placed close or near their properties and what that policy and structure would look like. And that was very interesting. And we thank Dominic um, for bringing that to our attention. At that time, all of these parties were very much on board with what we were trying to achieve from the framework document, which then led to our next webinar. Um, Julie, if you don't mind flipping to the next screen, which then brought both public and private sector together. And we were very excited about this particular opportunity as it was the first time that all these parties sat around together and started to talk about what this framework would look like. Um, the example that was shown to us is what they've achieved in the UK between the property developers 
and um, the building sector. So we were very pleased to have both the NHBRC with us, Salga Digital, uh, Property Developers, Elan Group participated, OpenServe and of course Huawei and the DCA were represented as well. Um, this really showed us some of the challenges within the public sector and um, how they rely on legislation to make a lot of their decisions. And um, we also looked at some of the roadblocks that the developers are experiencing that are preventing them from um, putting the fiber in the ground or, or being part of that process or however that might look. And it's worth listening to this webinar when you have an opportunity to. And we also tabled some solutions. So that very much brings us to where we are today. This is the third webinar in our series. So we are now looking at and Marius will be the best person to talk to us about this, is where we are, what is an overview of where we've come from, what we're doing, and then of course, what is the ultimate goal of this framework collaboration? So Marius, if I can hand over the, the uh, presentation to yourself or hand over the, the discussion to yourself, and um, thank you so much uh, for being part of this. Thank you, Louise. Thank you for that introduction um, and brief on the first two webinars. Um, I think, first of all, I would just like to thank, you know, all of the people that we've had that willingly participated in webinar number one and two, and also those that are here present today, because I'm sure we're going to get a, a lot more insight into the real world industry and the challenges that we face um, on, a, on a global scale and, and, and even back home. So the the the, the we started off by, by looking at the challenges that we face. Being Huawei, having exposure in 170 countries globally, we understand the importance of connectivity and the importance of fiber. And we've seen some amazing things happen on a global scale. Um, much of it can, can be attributed uh, and has been fast-tracked because of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and because we understand now the importance of connectivity. And fiber is a critical, critical medium. And, and one of the things that we identified was the challenges that, that developers face, operators face, uh, ISPs face in terms of getting those fibers in there and, and giving the connectivity to everybody. And ultimately, that is the goal that we want to achieve is we want to see that everybody gets connected and we all have access to the same services and solutions. Now, um, we, we saw then uh, we looked at international cases from from Ofcom from the UK, which were implemented very successfully. And we said, it's time that we establish a local forum where we start engaging with one another. Because the, the, the interesting thing is when I speak to stakeholders uh, separately, we all speak the same language. We all understand the associated challenges um, and we know what the barriers are out there that, that we need to resolve. But, but there's no forum where we can come together, discuss, engage, ask the questions, share the ideas, share the contact details. In many cases, it might be as simple as a developer who's not sure who can I speak to when I want to do A, B, C, and D. And then ultimately, um, our goal is then from here, we look to, towards next year, is establishing a forum, a work group, um, obviously, parties like Digital Council, Africa will be will be instrumental in all of that with the leadership that they can provide us and the experience with uh, and connection with all of the stakeholders. And then we're also working around um, with stakeholders, asking the questions, and we, we're starting to document a lot of these things. So ultimately, in future, I would like to see a, a pre-provisioning sort of industry paper guideline that is made available to all stakeholders out there so that we take the guesswork out of all of this and then government involvement. You've mentioned uh, we've had Salga and the NHBRC involved. They are important stakeholders as well. So the, there's aspects of skills development that would need to be addressed and then hopefully um, get, get the legislations and bylaws to support what we ultimately would like to achieve in the industry. Now, it's very encouraging if you go onto my broadband today and you just uh, search there on, on fiber or fiber development, you will see um, that there's been 
amazing things already happening. The recognition from government side, recognition from stakeholders like Twane just recently talked about uh, digital cities. Um, and then you've got the operators who all now have adopted and aligned their strategies to be fiber inclusive. But yes, our biggest challenge remains the actual developers and how can we help and assist them to, to have a, a, a avenue or a method of cooperation that, that is to the benefit ultimately to the consumer. And that is what, what, what it is all about. And we're very excited about it. And we really look forward to today's webinar um, and 2021 with, with the stakeholders. Thank you. And thank you, Louise, for, for Estate Living, uh, for, for allowing us and partnering with us in, in creating this platform uh, and setting a base for what the future uh, will bring. And I think it's going to be very successful. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks, Marius. You know, and I agree with you. I think one of the number one issues that has been coming out of the communication to date is the is the lack of uh, information that's accessible for, especially for developers working on the urban edges. And that's really what was established when we met, when Dr. Chris Mulder was with us in our first webinar, was that, you know, he saw this fiber coming in. It was the, you know, the guys are working on the road, you know, you're kind of pulling over with your car, trying to flag someone down. You don't know who to speak to. You don't know how to speak to the right person. You don't even know if this, the, the line is going to, um, you know, if you can even access the line. It's coming right past your front entrance, but you don't know how to access it. And, um, and this certainly has been a challenge. And so access to information, as you've highlighted, is one of the criteria that we're gonna be addressing in 2021. And it seems like that trickles down to the NHBRC as well, who are working under a directive. So they would need the specification and guidelines. And it has been one of our surveying questions is, do, re do uh, developers themselves have specifications and guidelines? Um, or are they relying on the teleco, you know, to the telcos to provide those specifications? And, you know, what does that mean in the market? So it, it really is a big, a big subject. Um, and we're, but we're getting there one, one webinar at a time. Um, so thank you so much and, and thank you for that summary. Now, it is really, really great to see a development that did have know who were the right people to speak to and uh, were able to um, install fiber into their area. I think uh, just to set the stage, so um, the Glen, Glen Cullen private uh, estate is out in Middleburg. I, you know, um, Olaf, are you referring to it as an estate? It's almost like a municipality unto its own. Um, I, that is out there. You've, you've, uh, it's completely enabled through digital technologies and sustainable practices. It's a very exciting development. And we're very grateful for you to be here today to share it with us. If I can hand this, uh, presentation over to you. Thank you, Louise. Um, yes, it is. It's a estate. We, we, we call it the Glen Cullen private country estate. It is a full town extension of Middleburg. Um, we are a proper approved town and, and um, yeah, so it's exciting. We, we are a little bit outside of town, but we in the urban edge. And, and that's what's exciting. That's what adds the value to, to all the, the future residents in, in, the, in the estate. Um, and, and what Mario said is, is true. We, we had the same problem. We, we didn't know who to approach, who to speak to, who to, you know, where do you start? Fiber wasn't anything that um, we had no knowledge of that in, in, in the future, in the past. So, um, yeah. I think the best is to have a look at how did we get there and then what are we doing with with the fiber um so so we are it's a privately funded town extension of Middleburg, um and we say to the benefit of the municipality and why are we saying it is because basically the municipality has no risk they take no maintenance on the estate whatsoever um but they do get taxes and and so they do generate the income um, if we can just have the next slide, please. Okay, so we aimed at creating a smart city, um, 
smart estate, if you would like to call that, and an amazing quality of life. So why do we say it's an amazing quality of life? Because you want to invest in something and save, and how do you get there? It's, uh, what we said is we have, want to have energy independence, water independence. We want to make use of renewable resources. We want to be energy efficient, create, build energy efficient, build and design energy efficient houses, homes, have high connectivity. Connectivity is, is communication. Um, and I think that was the essential part of getting our whole estate approved or Middleburg approved um, to be off grid is we had to have a lot of interaction with the municipality. Um, you know, a lot of studies had to be done and, and going out and explaining them because it's the first it's they've never been exposed to this um and and it was it was a challenge uh, it was a big challenge to to get the approval in place um yeah and and all of that then comes but if you, if you can fill all those boxes then you've got a reliable and sustainable estate and infrastructure which ends up in the in the consumer's hand because they get a good value for the investment. So that's coming back to the quality of life. They've got less stress, <laughs> less services to worry about. And, and um, they know in the future they can, can sell their property at, at, at a good rate. Uh, just the next slide, please. So we, we a person municipality saying that this is basically what we want to achieve or for them to take credit for is to be the first independent smart city town extension. Um, the municipality is a, a active member of ICLEA and that is a body that a lot of it's actually an international body that a lot of municipalities and, and um, governments can belong to. And fortunately, Middleburg was a member of, of, of them already. Um, since 2010, they they were a member, but they they've never um, had any projects that they presented to them. So we said to them, "Well, look, this is this is opportunity. Um, this is what we want to do, and and you can have the benefits of this project. You can register the carbon credits. You can do, reduce your carbon emissions. Um, all of this makes." At a, a lot more attractive municipality, which possibly in the future they can generate international, more international funding or opportunities to funding. Um, like I said previously, they can increase the revenue, they can reduce the risk. And what, at the end, a smart city is an attractive investment and it obviously will attract more, a bigger population and more people to, to Middleburg, which grows the economy of, of our small town, you can say. Um, next slide, please. So just a brief snapshot of what is um, Glen Cullen and or Middleburg Extension Line. Basically, we are 233 hectare estate. Um, we are included in the urban edge. Um, it's a state a town extension in the form of a country estate. Um, the council clearly said to us that we are not allowed to have um, stands that's under eight and a half thousand squares. So it's it's big areas, nice open open areas, um, in the form of then an echo estate where we have, want to have as low as possible impact with the development and want to use sustainable resources to to generate to actively put this in place. It's managed by Article Twenty One company and. It's a mixed use development. We've got, uh, we secured a, a private school. We've got business units um, and then also the, re the residential units. And and that's what we, like I said previously, we wanna boost the economy, create employment, and ultimately everything almost back to the benefit of, of the local municipality. Just next slide, please. So total, um, everything was planned. Every all negotiations was done but with sustainability in the back mind, saying how we're going to do it, what we're going to do. Um, so we've got 230 hectares. We've got 65 hectares of green open spaces. 
we can do horse riding, cycling, uh, pedestrian pathways, birding, all of all of that. We've uh, features we've got on the estate. We host a Middlebrook Park Run. It's a space development, uh, the, in the independent infrastructure, and then one of the main aims is, is the reduce the reduction of carbon and and energy efficiency. Just next slide, please. And then how are we going to achieve this? So we basically built, packed it out in two steps where we said, what is what is the site allowing us to do, which is very critical if, if you look at taking a development ever off grid or planning off grid development, because, because I believe not all sites are suitable for complete off grid. And then looking at the daily needs, uh, what would be in, 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 what would we cater for inside? And, but I'll explain all of them now, just each one separately. So just next slide. So smart thinking um, came down to the site. What what is what is the site? What it allows gradient, all of that. Or do we need a lot of pumping? All of that. So the the main name is space. We wanted to create space. Um, it was in the council resolution that we had to com comply with that, uh, continue to be between the existing ecological corridors. So there's an overflow between them, a well-connected grid of green areas that's open. The wet We have a lot of wetlands, most of that 65 hectares are, are close to wetlands. Um, environment, environmental management plan that emphasis on, on renewable energy and on water security. Um, I've said in, in the week that allowing or reusing our water and, and bringing back the and putting in grey water, we do have a dual plumbing system. As we calculated that we have a 37% extraction, and all of that brings it down to about 17%. So reusing water is is a big is a big bonus for us, and then also no boundary walls to create that canyon effect. Just the next slide, please. So smart thinking urbanization is green design. Um, we would we encourage uh, to have energy efficient buildings as far as possible, as, as wide as they can go on it. And then use green building methods, um, detailed architectural guidelines for each plot each plot is individually placed um, at the right spot with your civil engineer um, not to affect everyone else and to be ecological in, in that sense just the next slide please uh, rainwater management uh, we used natural drainage because we've got a lot of it um, all design has been done on minimum impact to the environment um, reduce flash floods, decelerate the speed of water, uh, use green surfaces where we can to, so, so really a, min, a low impact development and then make use of those natural causeways that is available out there. Okay, next slide please. Transport, uh, we've got a well developed um, network with footpaths in it. Uh, where people can cycle, run, even a horse, horse riding um, on the estate. We indirectly want to reduce fossil fuels, promote the, that these kinds of, um, I can say, uh, traveling around be, if, be used on the estate. And all, all facilities are more or less in close proximity to, um, to the, the main gate and those areas. Just the next slide, please. Energy and water supply, um, independent water and electricity. So we are registered as independent water supply with the municipality. Um, electricity, all houses will be serviced on PV, solar. We we looked at, in the planning, we looked at a lot of, of um, possible sources that can be done. And, and the NPV was, was the most sustainable. Uh, usage of local resources, 
it was was where we looked at everything that's available. We do have natural gas is available. Uh, we are on a coal fields, so that was an option. But it's all again burning fossil fuel, so that wasn't our mindset to look at. at, at uh, but it was one of the resources that was available. Um, reduce the internal cost. That that's a lot where where the fiber comes in and and can have a big contribution towards that. And then water recycling and dual plumbing, that brings down that usage on, on all the water, uh, reduce fossil fuels. It is maintained, maintained by the POI, the uh, property owners, and then it reduces the risk on, on, the, on our steep, STLM, a steep threat to local municipality, where they don't have any responsibility within the, in the state. Just next slide, please. So this is this is where we are today. Um, smart thinking, fiber networks. Um, we are putting a, a full fiber network inside the estate. Each each house, each stand will receive a connection point where they've got the um, the grey water, the clear, uh, the clean water, and the fiber connection is in in one manhole. So the homeowner just connects at at that unit. Um, it's all smart meters. So what smart meters comes back to reducing labor, um, reducing faults, uh, reducing risk costs, all of that. We've got a zone to perimeter fencing around, uh, also allowed by, by the fiber. Um, home automation, homeowners can, can go crazy on what they want to control, uh, look at, monitor. Um, especially with, with the solar, the batteries, the storage, um, and then it's, all of those are, is, is enabled due to fiber. Um, residential communication to the security gate, if there's a problem, medical, whatever um, can be, in the, you know, you can have it on demand. Um, smart monitoring and then also smart payments comes to the, back to the, to the smart metering system. Um, where you don't have all these office, you know, all the files and all of that. Everything is 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 monitored on the system, on the invoice and out. Hey, just uh, next slide, please. Waste management. Also, um, we had a look at, you know, doing a, a creative uh, waste management system. So we're working on a, on a wheelie bin system. Um, we want to do recycling and involve residents in it, also the community as well. Uh, we wanted to develop a leading process and um, currently Minsa Middlebrook Municipality is also employing the, the wheelie bin system. Uh, proactive recycling, uh, you know, get the community, get the homeowners to, to, to get into this process. And if you don't initiate it, no one will do it. Um, Supply to auto and the recycling in the city to the to the municipality. Uh, that was also one of the key things in our communication is saying, look, we're going to do this, but we'll give you feedback on on how it works, what's going on, um, ensure a low carbon footprint. That's the main aim of of I think everything. Just the next slide, please. So. What did we want to have and let Ken Cullen be known for is that it is a healthy living estate. It's a space town extension, um, sustainable learning. We one of the first things when we got the, or um, signed the, the private school is they asked us what's your connectivity, and um, I just forwarded that email to the ISP and he just sent back it's an open line you can have whatever speed you want. So, um, and they were very happy about that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, to have a vibrant and modern community, to have something else that's unique, we don't want to be like any other estate. And then the, the whole thing is to be connected and integrated. That's communication um, and that's essential because you can drive business. That's what we do and how we do it. And then finally, we just ended off um, saying to the municipality, please, please support our, our our project okay there you are 
Wow. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. You take what 10, 10 years of hard work and, and summarize it into a 20 minute presentation. And it's just, <laughs> and I mean, it just doesn't absolutely doesn't do it justice at all. It, it, the, the, the scale um, of this development. Um, I'm, I'm just, just quickly whilst we're, you know, we could just ask a couple of questions. You know, prior to us uh, doing the webinar, we spoke a little bit about your process. Um, and I think this is very important. Um, you mentioned that when you initially started the development, you weren't sure about who to speak to and how to connect this because by the sounds of it, and, I, and I'm sure rightly saying that connectivity is actually what's driving both the communication for the homeowners, but also um, the sustainable aspects, because yeah. um, you know everything seems to be data-based, um, smart, integrated, ease of living, cashless. You know these are the type of two, the phrases that are being used within our you know property space at the moment, and what buyers are looking for. And something maybe you didn't touch on as well is just is that it makes the, the development so much more attractive to potential investors having all of the security. So right. maybe you could just give us a little bit of a background about that process of, of you know, the initial process of connecting the estate. Mm -hmm. How did you go about doing that? Well, it, was, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. Like, I think what you're doing now is essential because um, a developer we don't know where to go um and and that that is one of the things we like i said we started off um we've got a few installers on on the mines in Mullerberg and 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 local suppliers of, of internet and and you you know we you're asking them and also none of them have done developments before so um yeah that, it wasn't easy um by luck a stroke of luck we the one um guy said to me well why don't you do it yourself and and i dropped it and, and then i go and had a look at who's supplying and who's who's the main players in in this game and i dropped an email to to dfa dark fiber africa and fortunately that email was returned and and the process started from from there picking up so um and i think yeah it, it's not that easy um at all i think there's is a guys that drops a few emails or try to connect on a few points before they can can um, actually get that service and and yeah and then it was um from them as a, as a main supplier it was who's going to be your isp um, when we started discussing this uh, either the options were either get a isp a internet service provider that's already operating or you must start your own ISP, and, and it's not so easy. Um, we're not in that game. We we're not in that business um, to register ISP and, and get on, on on the system legally is is not not easy at all. So um, yeah, and and obviously we had to register the project, and uh, but we looked at then we went to the market and said, okay, who's the available ISPs, or who would look at 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 um, taking over the project. And yeah, we settled on, on a company, Fiber First is, is our installer, and, and they would be running it then in the future for us, yes. Um, so, the, so the whole estate, you said you're taking fiber to each and every home. Um, mm. So if you look at the sort of the actual estate itself, you said there's a mix between wetlands and, you know, different types of uh, areas. That, I, I'm sure that those bring challenges um have you now gone and uh, created a set of standards of how the fiber would be in uh, installed or has has have you handed that over to dark fiber you know dfa and they are managing that process um i because i assume that this development is rolling out over a number of years and residential um, areas will be released in different phases how are you managing that process well um dear dfa is, is only facilitating our connection um it is actually the isp that's installer themselves also so it, it was coming down to um this is our layout plan of the estate uh this is the phases that we're doing where we're running and obviously want each house to have its own connection point so um 
we sat down with them and discussed the whole layout of the estate, where, where our services are running. Um, obviously, in the sustainability, we wanted to have a low impact, like I said, a low impact development. So we, we don't want to turn soil just everywhere. Um, so they trenched with us at, um, in, the same, in the same trenches. So we had to look at all of those options what's the, the spacing where do you put your fiber all of those technical as aspects of it and and then at the end is um you know your boxes obviously in our contract with them uh there's a certain privacy also where we don't want anyone just to when we're servicing our water or our pipes we don't want to infect them and and all of that so they're putting a their own box right on our manhole for that stand then and, and so we continue from the one to the next and, and then pick it up. There is certain spots where we can um, connect the hole or, or ring fence, if you want to say the reticulation um, at a certain stage. I think it's just on the finalization of phase two, we can sort of ring fence if we get everything connected. And, um, but yeah, it is, it's done each phase separately on its own. And um, tell me, you know, by the time that you reach so how many phases are there four five phases I, I don't it's three phases three phases three, yeah. so by the time you reach phase three um would you consider are you considering the inclusion of 5g technologies <laughs> good question <laughs> um yes controversy 5g um yeah, there's a lot of things going on in the 5G game. I think we'll sit back and, and have a look at, uh, you know, how how's the perception of, of people um, accepting, how they accept 5G. But, you know, it's, we didn't bring 5G into our, um, to our, you know, to, to our, how can you say, um, our media that we are promoting 5G and that 5G is pre-installed. No, we didn't. In fact, 5G runs on 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 um, fiber, so everything that you can do with fiber, you can do 5G. Um, so 5G needs fiber, um, and yeah, I think fiber is there for the next hundred years. It will be the, the main the main aim, the main running a supplier. So um, it it will be in the future up to the POA to decide what they want to do where they're going to use uh, 5G and for what purposes, you know. Mm. I, I suppose it comes down to, you know, automated vehicles, um, speed, you know, people working from yeah. home. I mean, uh, yeah. children, security. Uh, the security. I mean, yeah. our, the children of today are the buyers of tomorrow. And, um, and mm. you know, 100, 100 meg open, lines are too slow just too slow darling you know <laughs> anyone with a teenager will identify with that statement um mm. so it is and, and and i think as a property developer you very much have to look at the future and um and what is the anticipated needs of the buyers and what you know how that how that's going to evolve over the next 10 years or so um as you move from project to project Thank you so much for sharing with us um, your experience. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, it just brings so much more to light and into the conversation. And this is really what this, this framework is about, is understanding these challenges and seeing these opportunities as well and bringing it together into a collaboration. Um, and, you know, talking about the, the, the future, um, you know, Brett, Brett, when we started our webinar, um, you weren't with us, so we so I didn't get the opportunity to to introduce you, but uh, but I was yeah, I introduced you in your absence. So Brett Pitzer is certainly a man with his eye on the future, and um, he has developed a very very exciting uh, development called Green Hill Estate in Pretoria, and he's very he makes the bold statement. See, I'm, I'm going to get you to travel, Brett. He makes the bold statement of one day being a levy free development. And uh, I'm going to, I get to remember that in, in 10 years time, it's going to sort of hunt me down and <laughs> saying it. But 
a levy free in a levy free estate that has sustainable business practices in place that will be able to reduce the living costs uh, for each and every homeowner really is something to um, aspire to as well. Um, Brett, I know today, how are you feeling? You've uh, recently undergone a little bit of surgery, so we're very, very grateful for you being here. Um, are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm trying to give you my best side. You know, I've got a bit of a hamster side and then a not so hamster <laughs> side, so I'm trying to give you my best side here. No, yeah, thanks, no you look, you. look fabulous. Mm, thanks for having me. Thanks for, for everybody else's input. Uh, I've been listening intently to um, a lot of stuff going in the right direction. So thanks to everybody at um, at State Living for again uh, making this happen. So I was asked to join today to discuss basically how we've approached our security using fiber and technology at Green Hill Estate. So um, I'd like to just start by saying that the tackle or the challenge for any real estate developer in in my opinion and my opinion extends over three decades of real estate is that uh, the single weakest point of any development is getting people in and out of the gate so we could kick off please with the next slide so in a prestigious suburb like a waterproof Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, one of the challenges we face is that, you know, the gangsters follow ladies home from the mall um, and they go into the gate behind them, call it bumper bashing. And um, that predominantly was our challenge or what I, what I set out to get rid of at, at this development. My other pet hate is, as you said, Louise, thanks for that reminder, is the levy situation. So in getting rid of the human element, that was my main aim because um, most of your, well, I, I believe most of the cost as well as the weakest link is that human element at, at the guardhouse. And again, that's only my opinion. To the next slide. Next one, thank you. Um, so one of the advantages of this particular site is actually the topography. We're right on the top of the hill. So what they introduced for us was it introduced for us very efficient thermal technology. Um, and obviously all of this works on data and fiber. So, I mean, that's a given. But the topography gave us the height advantage and that gave us the ability to start pushing the net out, widening the net. So my aim was to use the technology that's out there, and we can go to the next slide. And instead of having a human factor at the guardhouse, we introduced things like thermal camera technology, as I just said, visitor call for entry, which is monitored from a guardhouse miles away, Again, no ability to overwhelm the human element at the entry point to gain access. Resident entry by way of fingerprinting, facial recognition, number plate recognition, which means no guard needed. And all of that is solarized and managed in my nerve center. So instead of it being the guard house, we now call it the nerve center. I just want to take you through a one minute video now of um, our partners in the venture and uh, we'll check more more after that so we can start with that. Thanks, Julia. <laughs>
big slide in thank you. So what it tying in with someone like Vim McCann brings to, to us as a development is, as I said, they would bring the neighborhood security to the area and we'd be able to manage an emergency long before it gets to our actual guardhouse or boundary. And as you can see from the style of reporting that's available, um, we've taken in that kind of partner to, you know, at night, if, for example, five guys leave Menland Shopping Centre at 10 o'clock at night, um, our armed response would ask those gentlemen where they're going long before they get to anywhere where it affects us as a development. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So, in essence, what I'm really saying is that We've done away with the traditional guardhouse concept, which is a house for guards to sleep in. And we've turned it into a high-tech nerve center where I've addressed issues like a manager's office and a storeroom. So we can manage the subcontractors that come onto the site. We have a single point of responsibility that person is responsible for who comes onto the site and leaves the site. Again, number plate recognition, facial recognition. You know, if someone comes there, a plumber, let's say, in a stolen car, we would immediately be alerted that that was a stolen car, all on the back of fiber technology. The next slide, please. Um, and you, it's quite funny that uh, one of the other things that I've, I've got in my guardhouse is uh, my nerve center, better said, is uh, a, a boardroom. Quite interestingly, I've managed a number of complexes in my life where the, the regular homeowners association meeting can be quite a colorful affair. So um, having a separate boardroom to go and have that out in is always a, a handy thing to have. And then for the last slide, um, what I just wanted to show you is a little bit about what we're doing inside because since we've gone off grid with this latest approval that we've achieved um, by Tswane, you can see that in that nerve center, each house is represented by a separate inverter system with a separate, separate battery system. And those systems are smart, so they can share energy between them. And you can see that it's all set up for management there. Um, and the idea being that um, any technical issues that need to be addressed can be addressed immediately by access to. We'll make sure the place is correctly heated, cooled, all of the above. And um, yeah, so the nerve center uh, has changed everything. And without fiber, that would never have been a possibility. And um, we've taken full advantage of, of the technology. But coming back to the levies, uh, you know, off-site guarding is 12,000 rand a month, on-site guarding 60,000 rand a month, and there's 39 units. So do the math, you know, we've already started that war on, on, on the levy situation. And, and it, again, it's my pet hate. So thank you for letting me share. And I hope that uh, some of this has been useful to some of you. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, so can I ask you just a few questions? So the, the infrast your backbone is a fiber infrastructure. So tell us a little bit about your process. Um, are you, are you going to install this, the infrastructure yourself and manage it yourself? Or have you, um, are you looking at outsourcing those services? We've installed the infrastructure for the fiber to go into. So for the fiber supplier at this stage, Fuma being that supplier, they will then pull their fiber into our infrastructure and they're looking obviously for end users. But they have, um, you know, and they have come to the party in the sense that while they're getting users, they've also brought in the Vumacam technology at their cost. They've installed infrastructure for us, uh, being that, you know, so we, we just really supplied the, 
the what's the word I'm looking for? The duct, the way for them to install their fiber. I install that, my cost, and the rest they bring in on at their cost. Um, and will they, I mean, there's obviously from the time that the ducts are installed to when they're actually going to put the fiber in to when the fiber is lit because you're selling, building, selling, building, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So the, are they, are they then shouldering the cost of any um, sort of delay in the process? So they're going to, you know, they're coming in with you so that, and then they will manage the, any cost associated with that. Um, is that correct? Look, I think you know, we're all going into it on the understanding that this is an off-plan development. We're building houses. There's going to be damages. But thanks, uh, Louise. I think I should revisit my agreement and just check if there's anything in the fine print about that. <laughs> um, so, so have you found that offering an off-grid solution and a technology-based solution has made the development more appealing to potential investors? You know, especially post COVID, I think people are a lot more aware of what can go wrong. You know, I think the bubble has burst and now people realize that it's actually quite serious. Um, so we're seeing a lot of focus towards that, but at the same time, you know, there's a price difference. And one has to get over that hurdle at the same, you know, so it's not cheap to build an advanced tech house. Uh, and some people just can't get there. But for those that can, that see the value, obviously they are, they are the one. Out of five people, I reckon three of them are aware and alert and looking towards solar. And two of them are just saying, never mind, you know, it'll come right. Build me a brick house in the development over there. But there are those that are just 100% aware of the fact that uh, the potential of it getting a lot worse before it gets better is there as well. So it's a bit of both. And um, so the, the, you know, to be able to go become levy free, you're looking at finding other costing mechanisms. Um, I know that uh, there's an opportunity to create income for the HOA or whoever, however it's managed um, through power sharing. Um, do you see opportunities with uh, internet as, a, as a, a revenue driving for you as a developer, maybe not necessarily in this development, but in the future, in future developments? Yeah, you know, um... I think what, what the experience has taught me about getting to the point where I can say that we're going to be, you know, this off-grid environment, uh, it's brought, an, in a, it's brought a, a, a revenue stream to the table that was never on the table. So us developers for our sins, you know, we make buckets of money and then for years we take that bucket and slowly but surely it leaks and eventually <laughs> scrambling around looking for petrol money and then we make buckets again. So uh, I think that's one of the negatives in, in, the, in the industry. But I think what I've tried to do here is a, a created a win-win scenario. So you allow me to put my panels on your roof and I give you back clean, spark-free, beautiful energy. But we've over... We, where we need 15 panels, we've got 30. So logic says to me that if I'm overproducing by double what we are going to consume, and I have an agreement with Tswane to take that power, even if it's only for 42 cents per kilowatt hour, the logic says to me, I've done away with the board. The real costs of the, of the homeowners association is basically the insurance on the common areas and the upkeep of, of, of the complex. So, so it's not a, do you understand? I mean, the, 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 the house owner is giving us the opportunity as a developer to generate energy, which is partly for them, partly for the other people in the complex, but there's plenty to go around and sticking that back into the grid can only get better. So I'm back in that horse. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much, Brett. And uh, it's it, it's so exciting to see, you know, at the end of the day, every you know, if most of what you're doing is powered through a, a fiber infrastructure. Just highlights again that that getting fiber into your, uh, you know, pre provision for fiber is far more than just making sure you can download videos. It's it, you know, it's about sustainability. <laughs> It's about cost saving. It's about solutions it around it's, security. It's it's so much more. It's so much more. I mean, none of this would have really been possible without it. And, um, you know, um, the original fiber here in this area was installed by OpenServe. And when I chatted to the guys, you know, their brief was it's the fastest, the best, it's the, the, it's the Rolls Royce. I don't know if it's got something to do with the embassies in the area or the consulates or whatever the story is, but being in Watercliff, I mean, we took full advantage of the fact that they've given us A-grade fiber backbone infrastructure and then, you know, clipping on all these ancillary services, number pack recognition. I mean, it's, it's almost instantaneous because of the fiber. So none of those things would really have been possible without it. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this what's thank you so much, Brett. And I think this is where Janita, your role is, as you can hear from, from the from the teams and the folks on the ground that, you know, we as as an industry, we, we are identifying the need for a for a fiber infrastructure pre deployment, fast, quick, efficient, um, sustainable fiber approach and so this collaboration and framework that we're working on is is so important um, if how we take it forward and I think if you're able to um, come in at this point and, and and advise us of where we are and um, and where we're going into 2021 and how um, the DCA will be working with the property industry to uh, to create this framework. Yeah, look, we're very excited, very excited to go forward. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing. And uh, if there's no more, no more questions, we good. Perfect. Yes, thanks, Brett. Okay, cheers, guys. Hi, Louise, and um, yeah, Brett, sure, that's that's really insightful, and I really enjoyed that um, as well as all of uh, presentation. It's really. Um, really you know, helps to make me think that you know some of the work that we've done over the last decade is you know is, is certainly paying off um and um yeah it's still it's still early days for a lot of um you know gated communities and, and communities in general you know in in our world we don't want to limit fiber deployment just to gated communities or security states you know we find that there's a massive adoption of of fiber um, for the very reasons that Brett, you know, sort of uh, deployed, uh, you know, security, um, you know, various IoT applications that's, you know, that's coming out. Um, and, and fiber is going to be, you know, be playing in an increasingly uh, important role in societies as we go forward. And, um, you know, you sort of touched on it with Olaf and, you know, so 5G potentially, you know, is for a lot of people that there's been such uh, a huge amount of fake news that have been going around um, about 5G and um, you know a lot of people are really concerned about uh, about 5G but actually um, it's no different to 4G and you know or you know it's actually there's a, a lot of research that that's showing that 5G uh, you know the uh, sort of um, microwave streams from 5G is actually less harmful than your radio in your car. But there's always these naysayers, just like there's people that believe that you should never put your food in a microwave oven and uh, everybody should be throwing theirs out the window. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that people want to believe. The fact of the matter is, is that 5G is coming, not because of any reason, but simply it's the next generation of mobile technology and it needs to come at some point like we went from 2g remember everybody had well i'm giving my age away but the old nokia phones you know we went to 3g and we thought that we were all the bees knees um we've gone to 4g or lte as a lot of people know it and 5g is simply put the next generation of mobile technology and it's going to 
become very important in our lives simply because of the amount of data that we consume. It's just the way that, as they say, the cookie crumbles. So like nobody now can go back to a 3G device and live without data. Um, you know, a couple of years from now, certainly within the next five years, uh, consumers will not be able to live without 5G and ongoing, I mean, already, and, and, and you know, Morris will be able to tell you, um, technology companies are already uh, looking and researching 10G. So that's how far the research is and in, in, in what's happening. So, you know, we're talking, um, you know, about something that's completely inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, it's not being forced upon us or, or there's nothing sinister behind it. It's just the evolution of the way that it works. But, um, but both, uh, you know, Green Hill and, and as well as all of the state are both very well positioned to capitalize on it when it comes because, um, rightly put, 5G is nothing but actually fiber. So, you know, you need a lot of densification. So to put it into context, 5G will give you approximately 100 meg speeds on your mobile device. Um, and it's not an either or, it's not either we will have 5G or we will have fiber. There's a very close symbiotic relationship between fiber and 5G and, and how, they, how they operate. Uh, you know, potentially we will use fiber inside our homes, but nobody can take a fiber strand with them in their car when they leave their house. So that's where 5G will come into play. And we are already living always on always connected lives. 5G will just make that more so. Um, and, and we will have smart homes, you know, um, exactly what Brett is trying to achieve. We will run our entire households from our mobile devices. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a restaurant, you know, and, and to a large extent, I'm sure that they're already doing it, but you will be able to monitor your home, who's coming out of the gate, uh, who's delivering, what vehicles are passing by your house. You'll have constant visuals through uh, CCTV cameras around uh, your, your home, managing your every infrastructure from your consumption to your water usage, everything will be managed from the palm of your hand from your mobile device. So, um, so, so for that very reason, you know, we still need to deploy a lot of fiber. Um, you need on average uh, approximately uh, a fiber point of presence or a pop every 200 meters to achieve 5G deployments um, in any case. So, but fiber is going to, uh, you know, fiber is here to stay. So if you haven't got it, I suggest you contact somebody uh, like our developers have done and, um, you know, engage with somebody to start that process as soon as possible because with the advent of work from home, it's going to become increasingly, uh, you know, demanding and, and the, the demand is actually already on the rise. So during the COVID pandemic, we've seen uh, an increase of about 40% in uptake on people that historically had fiber come past their homes, but didn't use the service. Um, so it's a, a massive increase, um, you know, and, and we're seeing that all around on all, all technology, including um, the mobile service providers, Vodacom released their results yesterday. Um, you know, they're just shooting the lights out. Um, so digital services are here to stay. Um, and, 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 you know, we can't live without both of them. You know, I don't have a landline at my home. I use my mobile device for voice, voice calls, but I run my laptop, my Zoom calls, all my meetings off my fiber internet connection. So it'll always be a, a, a you know a symbiotic relationship between the two. They're intricately linked at at the hip, um, and we're certainly not going to throw anything away and and into the water. Um, and for that reason, we feel that it's really important to start walking a road with developers to help them to understand how do you get fiber deployed, um, to help them with some best practice guidelines. You know. Um, uh, Brett certainly has the scars to show. I hope that's not from trying to deploy. Oh no, that's from the off year. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, but uh, but yeah. So so these gentlemen have had to walk a road. They've learned, um, you know, the hard way. They've had to learn, and and we'd like to make it easier. And you know, we're grateful for them sharing their stories um, in terms of how they went about to um, you know get fiber deployed in their communities, but. You know, we'd like to make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity 
to uh, get fiber deployed into their communities and um, have access to standards, know who to call, you know, have somebody to reach out to, um, to say, you know, we're stuck, we don't know what to do. A lot of the blockages are still at municipal level. Um, those are all areas where we can help and provide some guidance and inputs and, um, you know, develop best practice guides. So I'm hoping that those mavericks that have walked this road before, like Brayton and Olive, will, you know, help us with, um, you know, participate with us to develop this framework. Um, we'd like to launch a working group next year um, that will, uh, you know, develop a couple of white papers or, or easy to use um, step by step um, guidelines just in terms of um, you know, how do you get fiber deployed? Um, of course, it's easiest if you do it from the very beginning and there's no retrofitting, but it's not that easy for everybody. So, um, you know, some people still have to, we have to go back and, and redo it. But, um, but yeah, just uh, Louise, I see that there's a question from Jamie Lee. But yeah, just in terms of our walk, um, you know, going forward, uh, we'll communicate also through you to uh, the channels um, and um, just to provide some guidance as to how anybody can participate in this process. And, um, uh, you know, it'll be very important to have uh, developer inputs into this um, because, you know, as the saying goes, we don't know what we don't know. So, um, yeah, we'd love to have that uh, developer perspective. Um, you know, this ultimately is a document that's aimed at developers. So we'd like to do it right and help everybody to get um, the best connectivity in their development. I think, uh, thank you, Janita. And I think what you said there is very pertinent. You know, it's once it's best to get it from, the, from day zero, you know. And, and second to that, you know, if I look at opening up opportunities for development um, is to have a pre have a plan of a strategy a pre-deployment plan in place uh, working with municipalities um, often where the fiber goes the development might follow or will follow um, and it's really just looking at that landscape from both sides so we're very excited as over the last few weeks we've we've definitely got a, a number of key individuals and key players on board with us both from a um, private private development space but also uh, Western Cape Property Development Forum um, they're they're keen to join us in 2021 around summer tabling some of these discussions um, you know we've got Salga Moses is standing by uh, for any guidelines that we can share with them. Nurse from the NHBRC is standing by and that again is another um, area in which we will tackle which I'm sure the DCA will be tackling is how do we communicate those guidelines across into the building sector and so that on the ground the people that are actually putting in the fiber um, and the builders themselves are able to not just be able to install it within uh, residential communities but like you said across municipalities um, and across in 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 some very trying um, circumstances as, as from what we understand so this rounds up our 20 we've, we're over our time so thank you so much for those of you who stayed with us this is going to be recorded and distributed thank you so much to all the panelists and and thank you so much for the to the DCA for um, taking on this responsibility of keeping the conversation going. And we look forward to, uh, you know, sending out that, that spec and guidelines to the market um, during the course of 2021. So uh, thank you very much to everybody. And, um, and I look forward to our next webinar uh, next year. So, and thanks to our developers and, um, and have a wonderful day further. Julia, if you could please play the video.